Now, I argue that the Elohim stories of the Bible are not stories about God at all. They are stories about a totally different kind of entity and a plurality of entities. Elohim means powerful ones, the powerful ones. And there are stories of all kinds of powerful beings through the Hebrew scriptures. The Elohim were not one God, but were many individuals. Most importantly, they were not spiritual deities, but individuals in the flesh, the powerful ones, as Paul rightly defines them. It will become very difficult to remain comfortable with our conventional translations of these words. The way they behave in the narratives reveals that what we are looking at is ancient technology. Technology that previous generations of translators simply didn't expect to find, and so they didn't see it. Check out our official website at fifthkind.tv. For hundreds and thousands of years, people around the world have turned to the Bible for information about God. Two scholars, Mauro Bellino and Paul Wallace, argue for a radically different interpretation. Seeking out the root meanings of key words in these ancient texts, they find another, quite different story emerges. One with enormous implications for our understanding of the human race and our place in the universe. For more than two millennia, readers have interpreted the ancient texts of the Bible as stories of God, a seamless narrative in which God creates the heavens and the earth, botanical and animal life, and eventually, the human race. However, a number of anomalies in the texts, along with intriguing questions of translation, point to another possibility. Paul Wallace is an internationally best-selling author, researcher, and scholar of ancient mythologies. Over the last decade, Paul's work has probed the world's mythologies and ancestral narratives for the insights they hold on our origins as a species and our potential as human beings. As a senior churchman, Paul served as a church doctor, a theological educator, and an archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia. Paul's work in church ministry has included training pastors in the interpretation of biblical texts. His work in biblical translation and interpretation has revealed a forgotten layer of ancient story with far-reaching implications for our understanding of human origins and our place in the cosmos. Mauro Bellino is an internationally best-selling Italian author, researcher, and highly regarded scholar of ancient Hebrew. For many years, he worked for Rome's St. Paul Press as a Bible translator, providing with great precision the literal meaning of Hebrew words for Vatican-approved interlinear Bibles. It is an exacting discipline. The scholar must be rigorous in avoiding any kind of interpretation of the word and give only the literal etymological meaning of each word part. Morrow's findings set him at odds with the conventional expectations of the Catholic world and propelled him onto the international stage where his work has opened up a world of cultural memory recorded in the Bible. Yet hidden from the public for centuries by mistaken translation and the dogmas of the church. Together, Morrow and Paul show that the root meanings of a series of key words in the Bible reveal an earlier layer of information very different to the story of God associated with the Bible. Hidden plain sight in the pages of Genesis is an even more ancient narrative, one which reframes the whole story of human beginnings. Good morning, everyone. Today, Paul and I will continue with our discussion, and now we'll talk about the glory of God, once again with the aim of bringing the Bible back to its true meaning. Glory is the word by which the Hebrew word kavod is translated, 
And this is what we will discuss in this video. Today's work is not easy because Kabod is difficult to separate from two other elements that often appear together, Ruach and Keruvim, but I will try to be as clear as possible by giving a few very simple and clear examples. There are so many biblical passages in which this set of flying objects is mentioned, which are often linked together, Kavod, Ruach, Keruvim. To understand how many there are, I will show you a small list. Maybe in the future, Paul and I will talk about the whole system of Kavod, Ruach, Keruvim. Today, let's have a look at the Hebrew term kavod, which is derived from a verb that means to be heavy, to have a weight, but also to be honored, to be hard. The Greeks in the 3rd century BC translated this term with the word doxa which is translated in modern languages as glory. The translation of this term has always been conditioned by the usual divine interpretation of the Elohim that we have seen in one of our previous videos. The Elohim were not one God, but were many individuals. Most importantly, they were not spiritual deities, but individuals in the flesh, the powerful ones, as Paul rightly defines them. The theological elaboration has distorted the meaning of the term kabod and has chosen to translate as glory a word that instead means something quite different, something very concrete, powerful and also very dangerous. And now let's look at the passages of the Old Testament that tell us about this glory and the way it manifests itself to men. We will understand that Kavod was a concrete and material object. Among the many possible examples, let's start with the book of Exodus. We are in chapter 33. Moses wants to be sure that the Elohim named Yahweh, who had revealed himself to him, was able to fulfill his promise to conduct the war of conquest of the promised land, and so Moses asks him to show him his kavod. In essence, Moses wants a proof. He wants to see the instrument of the military power of this Elohim who made promises of conquest. The Elohim Yahweh understands Moses' need and accepts his request. However, Yahweh warns him that what is about to take place is extremely dangerous. It may even cause his death. And so the Elohim prepares for the event with a series of very practical instructions and takes some precise precautions. First of all, it tells Moses to be ready to climb up the mountain the next morning and that no one, neither man nor beast, must be on the slopes of the mountain, otherwise they will die. He tells Moses that he will not be able to see the cupboard from the front, but only from the rear, because otherwise he would die. Then he tells him that when the cupboard passes, he must take cover in the crevice in the rocks at the top of the mountain, so that Yahweh will be able to protect him and save him from certain death. 
The story continues and everything takes place on the top of the mountain while the people from the plain below witness the powerful phenomena and noises produced by the so-called glory of God. After this experience, Moses comes down from the mountain and presents himself to the tribes of Israel with his face reddened as if burnt to the point that when he is outside he must always cover himself with a veil that he only removes when he enters the tent. These outcomes are difficult or even impossible to understand when speaking of a spiritual glory, but they do not appear so strange when one considers that in Exodus 34 it is said that when Moses ascends the mountain, the cavode of the Elohim is located and dwells on the summit, producing a cloud that covers it. So, we speak of an object that comes, passes, and then stops, or rather, we would say, lands, on the top of the mountain in front of Moses. Face it with all this, which is very clear in the Bible, we ask ourselves a few questions. How is it possible for Moses to ask God to give him proof of his power. How come God didn't have the glory with him, but had to bring it the next morning to show it? But those who looked at God could not automatically see his glory? Why? It is said that the glory of God passed from one place to another. What was this glory that could not be seen from the front, but only from the backside? What was passing in front of Moses that was so dangerous that it required special protection? Why was Yahweh unable to protect Moses from the effects of his glory while mere rocks could do so? Why would the animals that were in the vicinity of the cupboard also have died? What fault did they have? Why could Yahweh not have protected them? What happened to Moses so that he came down with a burnt face? Was he hit by some radiation that, like the sun, produces burns? And so, then, we ask ourselves, is God unable to control the effects produced by His glory? These are questions that are impossible to answer if we thought that Kavod was the spiritual glory of God. It would simply sound absurd and incomprehensible. But let's look again at some very interesting examples that confirm the concreteness of this kavod, the so-called glory of God. In Exodus 16 is narrated that Aaron was speaking in the wilderness to the people of Israel, and at some point all the people turned towards the wilderness and so the cavode of Yahweh hung up in the sky, inside the cloud. It would be worth speaking about this cloud. Uh, perhaps uh, Paul and I will do so in the future. Again, it is clear that in order to see the kavod, which is supposed to be the glory of Yahweh, they must look upwards. Perhaps their attention had been drawn by a loud noise. It is therefore clear that the glory is a well-defined object located at a precise point in space. Thus, this glory clearly has a limited physical dimension. This event speaks for itself. No further explanation is necessary. 
But let's move on and come to the book of Ezekiel. I will mention just a few of the many events and then leave the floor to Paul. In chapter 3, the prophet narrates that he has been lifted up by a ruach and says, I heard behind me the sound of a great earthquake as the covenant of Yahweh rose from the earth. This uh, translation seems an invention. In fact, some Bibles, as the King James Bible, write that the glory of God was being blessed from that place. But how does a place bless the glory? It gets even more absurd. And as a matter of fact, it is a misreading of the Hebrew word berum and of the entire construction of the sentence. The confusion in these translations stems from the fact that the term berum is read as baruch. And baruch means blessed. But in Hebrew, the correct reading is Berum. And Berum means to rise from the ground. The exact translation that I have mentioned earlier is found in many Bibles and has even been confirmed by the Hebrew exegete Professor Emmanuel Tov in his text Textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible. So there is no doubt. The Kavod of Yahweh is on the ground in a very specific place, and as it rises, it makes a great noise. The Bible cannot be any clearer than that. The Bible is also clear in chapter 10 of the book of Ezekiel when it tells us about all the aerial evolutions that the Kavod makes. The Kavod stands in the inner courtyard of the temple, it rises from the ground, passes over the upper part of the temple, stands over the Kerovim, who probably were flying machines, and their wings made such a loud noise that is, was heard even by those who were outside the outer walls of the temple and could not see them. Then the Kerovim and the Kavod rose up and the Kavod of Yahweh went to rest on the mountain that was to the east of the city. We shall speak another time of the Kerovim as flying machines Although it is a very interesting topic, but today we are dealing with Kavod. In chapter 43, Ezekiel describes the Kavod coming from east, once again producing a loud noise, and the earth beneath was shining. First of all, we must say that if the Kavod came from the east, it means that the glory of God was neither north, nor south, nor west. That is, it was limited in space. The Greek Bible clearly says that the noise increased as the Kavod approached and the light it produced illuminated the earth just below it. There can be no more concrete description of the arrival of a flying object that produces very precise sound and visual effects. Ezekiel was not asleep. He was definitely awake. He was not a madman in the grip of visions. He even compares the various encounters he had with these flying objects and says that in one of these experiences 
he had finally understood what were those objects, the Kerouim, that he had encountered once before on the river Kebar. The examples could go on and on, but the Bible in these passages is so explicit that it needs no further explanation. It is very, very clear. The kavod is not the spiritual glory of God, but a concrete object, as Dr. Jeff Banner, founder and the president of the ancient Hebrew Research Center, also states. In one of his dictionaries, he writes the following about the kavod. Let us read the entire passage. The original concrete meaning of kavod is battle armaments. This meaning of armament fits with the literal meaning of the root of kavod, which is heavy, as armaments are the heavy weapons and defenses of battle. In the Exodus 16, Israel will see the armament of Yahweh, the one who has done battle for them with the Egyptians. As we know, Hebrew is a polysemic language and therefore each word can have more than one meaning, so that the term kavod can also indicate the respect owed to an important person a person of weight, as they say. However, in order to avoid making a mistake, as we have already shown with a few terms examined in the previous videos made together with Paul, whenever we find the term glory in the Bible, we should replace it with kavod so that we avoid any unnecessary controversy. Then we read carefully what all the context tell us when it speaks of Kavod and each time we will understand exactly what it is about. Ciao from Italy, see you next time, an intercontinental hug to Paul. Ciao Mauro, I love Mauro's treatment of the word Kavod. Now, the way it gets translated in English is rather perplexing and vague. It comes out as the word glory. And in religious usage, glory becomes such a vague word that it almost means nothing more than wow. When people say glory, they mean wow. It's the wow of God. But, you know, even in that association, I think there is a reminder of the original response of people to the kavod of Yahweh. So what were they seeing that evoked this response? I don't think the word means wow, just to clarify. I agree with Mauro that the usage in the Hebrew texts suggests we are looking at something objective, something physical, something material. It's something local. It's here and not here in Exodus 33. Now it's in the sky, now it's on the ground in Exodus 16. Now it's moving across the mountainous terrain of Sinai in Exodus 33. So I have come to the same conclusion. We are looking at something local, physical, material, objective. So to return for a moment to the point where we left off in episode Five in Psalm 24, where we were opening up the doors to the Olam, to the beyond, to the other, to the unknown, waiting for something to come through that doorway. And what we were waiting for was Melech HaKavod, the king with his kavod. I'm going to argue that what comes through that doorway is something physical and material something objective. So what is it, this kavod, that comes through? 
Now to get a better idea of what this kavod is, I want to go back to Exodus 33. Now the way it's translated at the moment is fascinating, but clearly indicates there's something else going on that we've not quite got to in today's translations. When Moses asks Yahweh if he can see Yahweh's kavod, Yahweh says, no, that's not possible. You can't see my, and here's the conventional translation, you can't see my glory face to face, except it will kill you. So he can't see the glory of Yahweh face to face without being killed, and yet he's been talking face to face with Yahweh for several days, and he's not been killed. And so the answer rolls like this. No, you can't see my glory or it will kill you, except when you can. And now you've asked, you can't. You can't see my glory, but you can see my goodness. But you can only see my goodness from behind. But only after the mountainside has been cleared of people and animals. And then you can see my goodness as it moves away from you, but you'll have to be hidden in a cleft in the rock in order not to be killed in the process. Now, that really is not a coherent picture, is it? Any reader is left absolutely baffled by what we're told there. And I'm not saying that out of any disrespect to the translators, because I think what's happening here is that something material and physical is being described. I happen to believe it's technology. And for centuries, we've had generations of Bible translators who had no technological grid by which to understand what was happening in this moment. Their view was they were translating a spiritual phenomenon, and so they looked for spiritual language. And so tub becomes goodness, kavod becomes glory, pane means face to face. But those translations don't work. Now, I am going to suggest that kavod is a craft. And that the reason that Moses cannot see the kavod pane when it launches is that we're talking about a launch of heavy equipment. Kavod, heavy thing. And that the thing that's going to move away from him, that's going to launch, and he's going to see, but protected in the cleft of the rock, is the goods, not goodness. It's heavy equipment. And that pane is not face to face, it's talking about out in the open, on the surface. I believe Yahweh is saying to Moses, you cannot be out in the open when the big heavy thing launches. You will be able to see the heavy equipment moving away from you, but you will have to be sheltered in a cleft in the rock. Now for me, this evokes personal memories of seeing the space shuttle launch. The technicians closest to the launch place of the shuttle are three miles away, sheltered, not in a cleft in the rock, but behind three meters of concrete and the technicians operating the craft itself are in a totally different state altogether. They're in Texas. So when Yahweh says you can't be out in the open when the big heavy thing launches or it will kill you, it makes perfect sense. The problem has been generations of translators who've never seen a rocket launch, who don't have a technological framework even in mind. They're not even looking for one when they get to this passage. And that's why we have a translation that's very unsatisfactory and has not got to the bottom of this physical, material, local thing that has such a physical impact on the environment around it that the territory has to be cleared of people and animals and people have to be sheltered in clefts in the rock so that the blast will not kill them. Now, if you have any doubt that the Kavod is a piece of equipment that operates like that. We're given further detail in the book of Ezekiel. From the New Jerusalem Bible, Ezekiel chapter one, verse four. I looked, a stormy wind blew from the north, a great cloud with flashing fire and brilliant light round it. In the middle, in the heart of the fire, a brilliance like that of amber. And in the middle, 
what seemed to be four living things. They were of human form. Now as I looked at the living things, I saw a wheel touching the ground beside each of the four-faced living things. The appearance and structure of the wheels were like glittering chrysolite. All four looked alike, and their appearance and structure was such that each wheel seemed to have another wheel inside it. In whichever of the four directions they moved, they did not need to turn as they moved. The circumference was of awe-inspiring size, and the rims of all four sparkled all the way round. When the living things moved, the wheels moved beside them, and when the living things left the ground, the wheels too left the ground. They moved in whichever direction the Ruach chose to go, and the wheels rose with them, since the wheels shared the Ruach of the living things. Now once again, what Ezekiel describes is a local physical thing. He says where he was when he first saw the Kavod. He was by the Kibar River. And then he says where the Kavod appeared. It appeared in the sky. And he talked about the heavens opening, which reminds me of the mysterious doors to the unknown in Psalm 24. The heavens open. And then he talks about what it was that came through this whirlwind. So we've got some really interesting words here. Seara Ruach, a whirlwind wind, was coming out of the north, a cloud with great raging fire engulfing itself and brightness all around it, radiating out of the midst of the cloud. Now that's not hard, for a 21st century eye to picture. You picture a launching rocket, that's exactly what you're seeing. A cloud with fire in the middle and bright light emitted by the fire that radiates the cloud and surrounds this craft. He then speaks about four beings who looked human. The appearance they had was in the likeness of a man. They looked human, which is a funny thing to say. The reason that Ezekiel is called apocalyptic literature is because what he describes is mystifying. He simply describes what he saw and leaves it to the reader to work out what it was, because he might still be puzzling over it himself. He describes the noise that the craft makes when it moves. He says it's like the sound of many waters, like a great waterfall. Again, that comparison is not difficult for a 21st century mind to imagine. And just in case we thought that this was a spiritual phenomenon he was describing, he describes the wheels and how they operate. And he describes those wheels in such great detail that NASA has a patent on them issued in 1974 to Josef Blumrich, who was a senior developmental engineer for NASA back in the 1970s. So the detail of the physical thing is such that wheels have been built to that patent and are still being used to this day on remotely operated rovers used in the exploration of Mars. Ezekiel continues to describe what he saw. He talks about a throne, which I would suggest we could translate as captain's chair. He describes the canopy over the craft. And it's the last verse of Ezekiel chapter 1 that identifies this strange phenomenon as the kavod of Yahweh. Now Ezekiel is then flown around in this kavod. It can fly, it can move, he describes the noise when it moves, he describes the appearance when it arrives, he speaks of the places that they visit, until finally he's put down at Tel Aviv, where he is so overwhelmed that for several days he cannot even speak. He's in such shock because he, Ezekiel, has never had an experience like this before, and he doesn't know how to understand it. 
which is why he tries to describe what he saw and heard so that the reader can interpret it. Now, how a reader would interpret it who'd never seen an aircraft, never seen a space shuttle, never seen a rocket, never imagined anti-gravitic technology of any kind, how that kind of reader would understand the text would be different to how we understand it today. But we have a framework to look at this and say, I think I know what this kavod was. And I think I know what this ruach was because the two words are being used to identify the same phenomenon. Ezekiel chapter three, verse 22. While I was there, the hand of Yahweh came upon me and said, get up, go out into the valley and there I shall speak to you. And reading from the Hebrew, so I arose and went out into the plain and behold, there the kavod of Yahweh stood like the kavod I saw by the Kibar River. And I fell on my face and I entered the Ruach. There's a unique word in this sentence, which has provoked other translations in which the Ruach enters Ezekiel. But the order of the words implies that Ezekiel saw the Kavod and then entered the Ruach. Another moment in which these words are being used to reference the same material phenomenon. The Ruach lifted me up and behind me, I heard a great vibrating sound. Blessed be the kavod of Yahweh in his dwelling place. This was the sound of the living things' wings beating against each other, and the sound of the wheels beside them, a great vibrating sound. The ruach lifted me up and took me, and I went, bitter and angry, and the hand of Yahweh lay heavy on me. I came to Tel Abib, to the exiles beside the river Kibar where they were living, and there I stayed with them in a stupor for seven days. Over the heads of the living things was what looked like a solid surface, glittering like crystal, spread out over their heads above them. And under the solid surface, their wings were spread out straight, touching one another. I also heard the noise of their wings when they moved. It was like the noise of floodwaters, like the voice of Shaddai, like the noise of a storm, like the noise of an armed camp. And when they halted, they lowered their wings, there was a noise too. Beyond the solid surface above their heads, there was what seemed like a sapphire in the form of a throne. High above on the form of a throne, was a form with the appearance of a human being. I like that Ezekiel tells us something of his point of view experience, that he describes being in the craft, the textures that he can see, the sounds that he can hear, and the fact that all the while the pilot, who is like a human being, is trying to discuss religion and politics with him. The one like a human being seems anxious to shore up the authority of Yahweh over Ezekiel's people group. And he's saying, look, I'm making you a spokesman. Ezekiel's clearly having a privileged experience seeing the higher technology that Yahweh has. And he's being asked to take on a particular responsibility to be a spokesperson to try and keep the people in line so that they're more easily managed by Yahweh. But all the while that the one like a human being is trying to discuss religion and politics with Ezekiel, he's distracted by the wheels, how the wheels work, the wings, how the wings work, the texture of the dome above him, the texture of the material surrounding him, the noise every time it moves, and the fact that they are airborne and that he's being transported to different sites. I love that he talks about the effect on him when he was put down at Tel Abib, that he was so overwhelmed that he couldn't speak coherently for seven days. So I think when you've got something you can sit in and be flown in, where you can describe the textures, parts of it like sapphire, parts of it like crystal, when you can describe the sound it makes when it moves, 
you know that what's being described is physical, material, objective. That is the glory. That is the kavod that comes through the doors to the unknown in Psalm 24. I think when you put these words together, olam, kavod, and the word we're going to look at next, ruach, it will become very difficult to remain comfortable with our conventional translations of these words. The way they behave in the narratives reveals that what we are looking at is ancient technology. Technology that previous generations of translators simply didn't expect to find, and so they didn't see it. So I've told you my thoughts about some key words here. Kavod is a big, heavy thing that flies, can take passengers, uh, launches, uses very 3D technology for getting on and off the planet, arrives in something that looks like a whirlwind. Maybe we would call that a wormhole. I'm going to suggest that tub is equipment, not goodness, that pane means out in the open, not face to face. Now, if you're finding this stretching, once again, I return to our favorite point, which is rather than us argue over translation, let's leave some of these key words untranslated and then just watch how they behave in the text, because you might simply disagree with me on all those points. How about we leave the words untranslated? Leave tub, pane, kavod, ruach. Olam, untranslated in the texts, and then look at how they operate. Look at what a kavod does and how it behaves and leave it untranslated. Look at what the significance of pane is and how that operates in Moses' encounter with the kavod on Mount Sinai in Exodus 33. Look at how the tub moves and what it does in order to get an idea of what it is in the Sinai adventure. How they operate will tell us what the ancient writers were talking about, what it was they saw in the deep past and said, wow. We only rob ourselves of amazing insight and information if we just settle with our familiar translations instead of digging a little deeper and allowing the world of the ancients to open up for us, a world that may be quite stretching for us in terms of our worldview, but ultimately is very enriching to our understanding of the Bible and other ancestral narratives all around the world and our own understanding of our place in this amazing cosmos. The final edit of the Old Testament of the Bible, the Hebrew canon included the layering of some beautiful and profound theology over the top of ancient texts. Unfortunately, mistranslating traumatic ancestral memories as if they were encounters with God is a choice with far-reaching consequences. Belief in a violent, xenophobic, hierarchical God has been used through the ages to justify violent wars and all manner of abuses. However, the fidelity which the ancient manuscripts have been curated in the Hebrew canon by countless generations of priests and scribes means that in our generation we can now return to these fascinating artifacts of our prehistory and ask how differently they might be translated. To find out more about Paul Wallace and Mauro Bellino, along with links to their published works, follow the links in the video description. Thanks for watching The Fifth Kind. Please subscribe and click the bell icon so you never miss out on new content. For more thought-provoking programs, interviews, and documentaries, check out our website at fifthkind.tv.